persuading them in a mathematical way. They were interested in, you know, well, what happens if you don't know this? Did the X set is reference to number zero or something else? It was very much driven by concerns about the sorts of descriptions we use uh, in mathematics, these sort of functional expressions. Whereas the Strawson tradition is in that, that you know, ordinary language tradition, which is focused on how we actually use expressions was really concerned with the sorts of expressions we call referential, where people use descriptions to refer to things. So again, it's that, that clash that really, well, this, the, the, the two traditions, which really led to a difference in focus on even the type of definite description. And it's really strong to the push the table type cases, which is, of course, the course that sort of dominant eventually focused on, uh, these incomplete descriptions as well, uh, where um, Facts about the speaker and the context over and the hero are drawn on by the speaker in trying to use a description which is technically incomplete, uh, but manages to convey something very, very straightforward that tends to be complete. And the way to do that is to say the condition that the object is satisfied doesn't get into the proposition express, just the object itself. So the sort of Strawson road leads to capturing the proposition story, so by a problem. Um, and then, of course, what happens when you get Kripke and people involved, you've got the, the two traditions now. Kripke's got them both in mind at the same time, as I suppose Geach has, which is why they say, wait a minute, wait a minute, two things going on here. We need to separate that semantic reference, speaker reference, or semantic reference, personal reference. But you can see why logicians don't care about tables and chairs. Right? So they don't care that the, the table is incomplete. They can care about the successor of zero or the product of three and nine. All right, so let's look now to the, the, the dominant case. That's my diagnosis of what's going on in the dominant case. We really should only be concerned with what the speaker's referring to. Uh, and there is no notion of what the expression itself refers to. The only notion of interest, if we want to talk about what the expression itself refers to, it's going to be what the speaker's referring to. Because there is no independent notion of what the... Now, there are conditions specified by the descriptive material that something ought to satisfy if the speaker is going to be successful, not always, but this is the how to you can now capture the capital intuition in the sort of vocabulary which we, 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 we've got. We talked about etiological determination and epistemic determination of the content of what the speaker is saying and meaning. Um, the descriptive material is in there. The speaker's put that descriptive material in there because the speaker thinks this is going to, this has got a good chance of getting the hearer to focus on the objects that I want the speaker to focus on, the hearer to focus on. That's why I use that material. So again, we're back to this idea, the role of linguistic meaning is not constitutive here. Okay? When you use a description referentially, I mean people, Kaplan seems to be aware of this, a lot of people who talk about referential use of descriptions including Debit here, seem to be sort of blissfully unaware that there's an issue here for anyone who thinks that linguistic meaning is a constitutive determinant of what's said. Because the examples of misdescription that Donald talks about and that Kaplan talks about show that you're going to have to ignore the linguistic meaning to get the content of what is said here. You must insist that it's not a constitutive determinant. So it's not just the story I've been saying that it's not. Here, you're forced to say for this type of example, it cannot be. It must not be a constitutive determinant. And that's part of the Donald Kaplan story about descriptions used referentially. Right? What's said, the content of what's said, is not partly constitutively determined by the meaning of the definite description. It's the object the speaker referring to the description that gets in there. So if they're right about this, it would be very good for them to say, this isn't really something special we're just doing to fix things up here. It's a quite general theory that has this. It's never relevant to determining the content of what's said, which is, of course, the story that I'm trying to tell here. So if the, the, the story I was working on yesterday, when it was Wednesday, okay, was that we don't, the linguistic meaning is not a constitutive determinant of what's said. Uh, if that sort of story is right, 
it would guarantee that Donald and Kaplan are in the clear here, because it's never relevant anyway to determining the content. It's just part of the etiological story and part of the epistemic story, never part of the constitutive story. So this would be this would be good, where the, the Kaplan Donald story and the more general story about the constitution of what's said about involving linguistic meaning would come together nicely. Uh, by by Kaplan, yeah, if you don't mean the Kaplan of a singular proposition so that uh, I think in that case uh, the, the linguistic meaning uh, determines the content. Uh, no. I'm talking about Kaplan in that in the paper, where he wants to say that the, when you use a description referentially, the descriptive material doesn't contribute content to the It doesn't contribute to the determinacy. Is the character of the... Of the uh, no, it doesn't. See, because it doesn't, because the object doesn't have to satisfy it. In that, in that in Kaplan doesn't admit that there are uh, definite descriptions. Uh, the, the, the example is not of the name of the Martini. If yeah. it's not a drinking martini, yeah. uh, there is no mm -hmm. object which enters in the proposition. Yeah. If there's no... Oh, but look, Kaplan... Yeah. But, but, there. Yeah. Well, there. So what Kaplan wants to say is, what Kaplan actually says is, the case of misdescription, yeah. Donald shouldn't have focused on this sort of case. Because remember, what Kaplan's trying to do is recast what Donald's done in terms of singular general propositions. Yeah. He said, look, Donlin's mis one way of thinking about Donlin, it was a bit of a mistake to focus on the misdescription case. Because what's really going on is it's a difference not between whether or not something satisfies description, it's about whether it's a singular or a general proposition. Right? So in the case where it's a general proposition, Kaplan says that the, uh, the descriptive material itself gets into the proposition. Okay. Now, in the referential case, Kaplan's quite careful. He says, well, the descriptive material doesn't get into the proposition. Right, right, yeah. and, but he doesn't commit himself to what he's going to do with cases where the object the speaker does intend to refer to doesn't satisfy the descriptive material. Right? Now, I would, think, I would say you should just go with Donald on this. It's fine. No harm on this. If you're, not going, to, if you're going to say that the... Um, the descriptive material, the content of the, the, the descriptive material, I mean, doesn't get into the content of the proposition expressed, right? Um, that's as good as saying it's not a constitutive determinant of that content. I mean, there, there's more than one way of being a constitutive determinant, I agree. But the obvious way would be to say it just is yeah, part okay. of the content, right? So I would say that, that you might as well just say that the linguistic meaning itself doesn't determine, in any, in any sense, the content. Okay? Because the content is just going to be the object, and now you have a decision to make. Am I going to allow that object in there if it doesn't satisfy the scriptural condition? Or are we just going to say, you know, you didn't really express that proposition at all, right? You only thought you did. Now, what's tended to happen in the literature is the people who've gone along with this have said, you know what, that's a failure of nerve on Kaplan's part. He should have gone along with Don Lang. Um, Shipper is the best example of this, actually, where Shipper wants to say, if you use the pronoun he, okay, and it turns, you say, he's happy, and you point to this guy in the corner, and it turns out it's actually a woman, right, but dressed in a certain way and behaving in a certain way so that it looks like a man, and you said, he's happy, now what do you do? Shipper wants to say, you said something true. So this isn't just a case where the descriptive material, the pronoun, there's a feminine pronoun, right? And Chipper wants to say, well, you know, too bad. You meant something. So Chipper's going hardcore, straight, pure intentionalist here, no messing around, right? You meant that that person over there, you didn't mean that's a woman. You used the pronoun she because you thought that's the one, or, or, or sorry, he, because you thought that's the, the expression that will lead the person back. Now, even, and she said, look, even if you knew it was a woman, but you could see that given the lighting conditions or what the person was wearing, probably people wouldn't realize that was a woman. But you wanted to convey the information that that person was happy. And so you say, he's happy, even though you know that the person doesn't satisfy the, uh, the condition for conventionally being the uh, reference of a pronoun she, as we might put it in language we don't like now. Um, now, Debert is in a bit of a mess. Debert's in, in, a, 
And if one because debit wants to send the descriptive material gets in there as well. Uh, so debit can't agree with Schiffer on this. So debit also agrees there's a referential use of descriptions and he doesn't talk about singing propositions exactly. But he wants to say that the, the, the true conditions concern the object and they concern the descriptive, the descriptive conditions. So it seems to me, I think Debit's in the worst situation for people here. Schiffer's in a, in a situation which seems sort of counterintuitive, but you know, you think it through, it's not a bad theory. I mean, what's the point of using the word he? The point of using the word he in that situation was to get the person to the right person, the, the, the right reference. And it happened to be a woman. It wouldn't have worked if you'd used the pronoun she, because let's say there was a woman standing nearby who was very unhappy. You didn't mean that woman. You really meant the other woman who just looked like a, a, a man. And so you used the pronoun he. Exactly. Uh, that was the best choice of pronoun in the situation. That was the best one to use. It's like the dominant example of the king. Food, no? Yes, good, yeah. Mm -hmm. You say something you know false, but you know false, yeah. That, that's true for yes. the Good. Yes, and Grice, Grice has one about the, 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 uh, the loyalty exam. Grice has one said, look, suppose that um, everybody's very scared of the loyalty, of somebody called the loyalty exam. And you know that there's no such person as this, the loyalty exam. It's just this myth that people, we did it to make people sort of not be you know, disloyal. And somebody says, uh, you know, I've been really good this week, you know, I've done this, I've been a very loyal citizen, and he says, well, the, the loyalty examiner won't be this to you, they won't be taking issue with you. I said, yeah, yeah, that's right. And you know there's no loyalty examiner. Right? And so you don't have to be afraid of the loyalty examiner. That's true. <coughs> but even though you know there's no loyalty examiner. Same idea, yeah. So, uh, in the shipper case, it's clearly the best pronoun to use was he, even though it's a woman. What you care about is not really linguistic precision. You, you care about it's it's like soccer. You've got to get the ball in the goal. Who cares? You know, okay, you kill a cripple a few people on the way. You want the ball to get in the back of the net. That's your aim. You don't care how nicely it's done. You just want to get the ball in the back of the net. And the best way here was to use the word he. Too bad. It's a male pronoun. Too bad. Mm -hmm. I want to get my message across. So this is the best choice. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, if I want to score a goal, uh, Okay, uh, I, I can try to touch the ball with my hand, but, yeah. but this is not a goal. Uh, I didn't reach my uh, hand. Tell, tell Maradona. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you get away with it, it's fine. I mean, uh, okay. Okay. this is yeah, a bit like, yeah. so Schiffer's case is a bit like the hand of God. Mar Maradona, you know, he got the ball in the net, he used his hand, he cheated a bit, doesn't matter, he got it in the net. Okay, this, I mean, maybe the football example is, is not good because of the rules are about, a bit different, you're supposed to play by the rules. In la when you use language, are you supposed to play by the rules? Are there penalties for not playing by the rules? Well, that depends on the context. With soccer, there's supposed to be always. Okay? Uh, with using language, you know, a lot of times there are no penalties. It's understood. We're allowed, we're allowed to flat the language. We use metaphor. We use irony. It's encouraged sometimes. So we, we know some flexibility is built into the very idea of using language to convey messages. And a theory that's not sensitive to that is too wooden to be taken seriously. So traditional semantic theories that haven't taken seriously, I think it's just suspect because they haven't allowed for this type of flexibility. So I'm with Donald all the way on this now. Except I don't think we need to talk about the semantic record or the denotation description. That could be uh, left out altogether. Was it time to Okay, all right, let's, let's have some lunch and then, uh, and then talk about names. Uh, what do you mean? Thank you.